in this passage. Two beasts are in Revelation chapter 13. And uh, we need to identify these two beasts before we move on into our discussion here this morning. Uh, as I said, it will take a long time to go through each identifying characteristics in Revelation 13 and in other passages in the Bible to identify these two beasts. So I'm going to just show you a little bit of the background starting in Revelation 12 so we can understand what's going on. If you go to the last verse of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17, and it says there, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So this verse sets the stage for chapter 13 because... Then John says, right in verse 1 of chapter 13, Then I stood in the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the waters. And then in verse 11, he sees a second beast that comes out of the earth. So what is happening here? Chapter 12 of Revelation concludes with the dragon, which is Satan, with his determination to engage in the final battle against whom? Against the remnant, all right? That's what verse 17 says. And the dragons, a dragon was enraged and went to make war with the remnant of the woman's offspring. So he's determined to battle with the remnant. But in order to fight and possibly win the battle, he finds support in his two allies, he realized that he needs some help. He needs some allies. And who does he get as his two allies? That's Revelation 13. He gets the beast from the sea and the beast from the earth. There are three of them. Does this remind you about something? The Trinity. This is the false Trinity right here. The dragon, which is Satan. The sea beast. And the, false, uh, and the earth beast. This is the false trinity. And they are prepared to battle in the last days, in the final days of this earth's history, to battle against the remnant, and they're thinking to win the battle. So, in the first part of Revelation 13, we see the beast that comes out of the water. After carefully analyzing everything, every characteristics of this beast from Revelation 13 and comparing with other places in the Bible, like Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 8, and putting all of these things together, the prophetic interpretation is that this beast represents whom? Most of you know. It's an organization that is called in history the medieval church, or the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy, all right? I don't have time to go through every characteristics, but if you've never seen that in the Bible before and you're wondering what am I talking about, please come and see me after the service. We'll have a Bible study with you. Maybe not today, but we'll set up a Bible study, all right? But for those who already know, you've studied in the Bible, all the characteristics show that this is the medieval church, the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church. So that's the first beast described in verses 1 to 10 in Revelation chapter 13. Now, in the second part of Revelation 13, we have another beast that comes out of the earth. And the beast from the earth is Satan's second ally in this battle to, you know, in the last days against the remnant. And once again, putting all the identifying characteristics that are found here in Revelation chapter 13, we conclude, and the prophetic interpretation concludes, that this beast represents whom? United States of America. So, as we look at this Earth's beast activities in the last days, there is one interesting thing that this Earth beast is going to do, and that is found in verse, um, if we go back and we look in verse 13, once again. He, meaning the Earth beast, performs great what? Signs, so that he even makes fire come down from heaven. I entitled my sermon today, Fire from Heaven. And we want to see what is this sign 
of fire coming down of, from heaven. What is the purpose of this sign? Verse 14 really explains what is the purpose for this sign. If you read verse 14, and he, meaning the earth beast, does what? Does what? Deceives those who dwell on earth by those signs. So what is the purpose of the sign of bringing fire from heaven? What is the purpose? It's to deceive the people. It's for the purpose of deception. As I was putting the sermon together, you know, when you study Revelation, I'm going to give you one secret of how to understand Revelation much better. When you study the book of Revelation, you always need to look at the Old Testament stories. There is so many allusions to the Old and New Testament stories in the book of Revelation, and based on those stories, you can better understand what is this prophecy talking about. In the book of Revelation, there are over 400 allusions to the Old Testament. So do you think that it's important for us to go back and look at those stories and see how, what we can learn? And today, there are many stories in the Bible that talk about fire coming down from heaven. There are many stories. But I'll talk about four stories today quickly and put them all together and see what we can come up about this fire coming down from heaven in the book of Revelation. The first obvious story is, of course, found in Old Testament. I want you to open with me 1 Kings, <clears throat> 1 Kings chapter 18. This is a very famous story in the Old Testament, and we find this allusion to this story in Revelation chapter 13. 1 Kings 18, verses 20 to 24. We're not going to read those verses, but you can follow with me. This is... The story of Elijah. Remember the story of Elijah? And the showdown with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. What was there? What was happening? The background is simple. Uh, the people of Israel left God and they were worshiping Baal and other gods. And Elijah says, we're going to put it all together on Mount Carmel. And we're going to set up our offerings on the altars. And we're not going to put fire, but... You pray to your gods, I'll pray to the Lord, to the Lord God, and whenever, which, whichever um, sacrifice is being devoured by fire, that, that person, that God, is the true God. So, you can read that in verse uh, 24, it says there in verse 24, 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah set the rules for this challenge, and he said, then you call on the name of your gods, and I'll call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by what? By fire. He is God. So the story continues saying that the prophets of Baal tried, but they failed. And you, can, you know the story. You know, there is some funny things happening in there. Elijah was even mocking those guys and saying, you know, you have to yell harder because maybe your God is, you know, not listening. He's on vacation or something like that. That would be a funny thing to see, I guess. I'll ask Elijah how that went when he was mocking the prophets of Baal. But they failed. They, they would start cutting themselves and asking their gods to send fire from heaven, but it didn't happen. And then after that, Elijah prays. And I want you to praise to God in verse 38 and 39 and follow with me in your Bible. It says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said what? The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Now, it's interesting that before the showdown happened, Elijah addresses the burning question to the nation of Israel in verse 21. And I want you to go back to verse 21. 1 Kings 18, 21. He starts this way. He says, how long will you what? Falter. There's different translations. But how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. 
Is this question relevant to us today? Absolutely. God is addressing to us the same question. How long will you falter between two, three, four, five different opinions today? How long are you going to do that? In this story of Elijah, we see that God demonstrates through the prophet when he calls down fire from heaven that he is the true God. That was the purpose of this showdown to show who was the true God and that the Israelites should follow this true God. Now, we might say today that, listen, we don't get those signs today. Do we see fire coming down from heaven? Have you built an altar in your backyard and put a sacrifice and you had fire coming down from heaven? Anybody? Lately? No? Okay. If you did, I would really like to come and see that. But a lot of us can say, you know what? It was easier in the Old Testament because they saw the visible manifestation of the power of God. They saw fire. Of course I will fall down on my face and say, you are God. Was it easier? We can say we need a sign today. We need God to show a demonstration today in our lives. And then we can say I would certainly have no doubts anymore that God is God. Now, do we really need fire from heaven to believe in God? Doesn't God show us today in many different ways that he is God? <laughs> have you experienced that power of God in your life? Doesn't he show us every day, even the fact that we are alive today and here, isn't that the power of God? That's the demonstration of his power in our lives. Every little thing that we experience in our lives is the demonstration of God's power, amen? We don't need fire from heaven. It would be nice, I guess, to see that, but we don't need that. You can probably think of many things in your lives that you might look back and see it as a demonstration of who God really is. Romans 5, verse 8. I want you to go with me to this verse. Romans 5, 5 and verse 8. Beautiful text in the Bible. Most of you know this text. The Bible says this. But God did what? Demonstrate, demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ, what? Died for us. Isn't that a beautiful demonstration of God's power? Why do we need fire when we have the cross of Jesus? Why do we need the demonstration by fire when we have the, demonst the greatest demonstration of God's love towards us and his power towards us in that he sent his son Jesus to come and die for us so that we can be saved? That is the greatest demonstration of God's power in our lives. The Mount Carmel showdown was all about worship and allegiance. So the same showdown goes on in our lives today. Every day we face the same thing. Who are we going to worship? Who are we paying our allegiance to? To God or to the beast? When Elijah addressed the nation of Israel and us and today asking how long will they falter between two opinions, he was also asking them how long will they try to serve two masters. He was also telling how long they will be living in the world and be off the world. Also, how long they will walk in the flesh and pretend they walk in the spirit. Also, Elijah was telling them, how long will he compromise with this world? How long will they pretend to be followers of Christ when in reality they're just fans of Christ? And speaking in the words of Revelation chapter 3, how long will we just be lukewarm? How long will we compromise with the world? Is that a problem today for us as well? Absolutely. There are so many Christians that are just half committed to Jesus Christ today. Unlike the other gods, Baal and other gods at that time, God of heaven wants our complete allegiance and complete commitment to him. Baal didn't care if the Israelites 
spent six days worshiping God and just one day worshiping him. Baal doesn't care about that. The other gods don't care about that. But God of heaven wants how much of your time? All of your time, all of your commitment. He doesn't want you to divide your allegiance between him and other gods. Do we have our gods today? Do we have our Baals today? Absolutely. Everything that takes priority or place of God today in our lives is our idols, is our gods. And we divide our allegiance between God of heaven and other gods in our lives today. There are so many Christians today in our churches that are just half committed to Jesus. Or sometimes just a third committed or a quarter committed to Jesus Christ. God wants your complete commitment. In Revelation 13, now looking at this background of Elijah and the story of Elijah, of the fire coming down from heaven, going back to Revelation 13, the beast functions as a counterfeit Elijah. The beast from the earth is a counterfeit Elijah, a false Elijah who by bringing fire down from heaven misleads people into worshiping this beast. The issue in the last days of this earth's history will be about worship and commitment, your allegiance. Who are you going to worship? Who are you going to pay your allegiance to in the last days? Are you going to pay allegiance to God or to the beast? As the sign of fire from heaven persuaded the people of Israel that God is the true God and persuaded them to make a decision to serve and worship the true God. So in the last days, the beast will try to persuade the people through this sign of bringing fire from heaven to persuade them to worship the sea beast and pay allegiance to the sea beast. It's all about decision, decision and commitment. Now, let me say it differently a little bit. If we are undecided today who we are serving and worshiping, do you think that we will be able to decide when the time of persecution comes? <laughs> Some of you might say, well, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. I still have the time. But you're only, if you're only half committed or third or quarter committed to Christ today, do you think that all, on all of these events that are described in Revelation 13 are going to start happening in this world? You think you'll be able to make the right decision when you can't make that decision today when we live in freedom? You see, Satan will not care in the last days if you are still a half-Christian or not. <laughs> he will not care even if you're 90% still Christian or not. If he can get 10% of you, he got you completely. Our God wants full and complete commitment to him. And without that, we will be deceived in the last days. Full commitment to God. So the question is today, whose side are you on? Whose side are you on today, now, in your lives? You might think that you still have time, but all the events that are happening are really, really telling us that things are moving very quickly. Very, very quickly. So we have to start making decisions today. When Elijah faced the nation of Israel, he asked them the question, how long Will you falter between two opinions? And the same question is addressed to you today. How long will you try to serve two masters? How long will you try to falter between two opinions? It might work today, but it's certainly not going to work in the last day. So you must start making changes today. So this is the first story. The first story of fire coming down from heaven. It tells us there was a showdown about who are you going to pay your allegiance to and who are you going to worship in the last days. And that's true to Revelation 13. That's what it's all about in the last day. Let's go to the second, uh, to the second story. <clears throat> it's actually found in the New Testament in Acts chapter 2. 
Acts chapter 2. Now, before we go to the story in Acts chapter 2, if, when you're reading the book of Revelation chapter 13, and I ask the same question, maybe you have had the same question asked, the question is always, do we take this fire from heaven as literal or symbolic sign? A lot of people think that the beast will bring it literally fire from heaven and will demonstrate to people that they're, you know, uh, they're true God. Looking at the whole book of Revelation, and particularly Re Revelation chapter 13, I can't see any indication that we must take this literally. It is symbolic. It's a symbolic fire, all right? And I'll tell you another um, principle of interpretation, prof prophetic interpretation, is that whenever you start interpreting symbolically, you have to keep it through symbolically the whole way. You can't switch between literal and symbolical all the time. That's, no how, that's not how prophecy works. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that take revelation and half of it is symbolic, half of it is literal, and they get mixed up because the rule is, it has to be symbolic all the way through, unless the context of the book of Revelation really shows otherwise. And there are some places in the book of Revelation, when we study it together sometimes, I really want to study with you, I'll show to you where we can interpret literally, but in most cases it's symbolic. So this is a symbolic sign. So the question is, if it's symbolic, what is it stands for? So this is where we go to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, you remember that story in Acts chapter 2? Jesus goes to heaven and he tells the disciples to go and wait until what? Until the Holy Spirit comes on them. So, they w went to the upper room there, prayed and confessed their sins and they were praying and praying. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 2 and 3 says what? That suddenly the Holy Spirit descended upon them in the form of what? Tongues of fire. That fire came from heaven and it rested upon them. The Holy Spirit descended from heaven in the form of tongues of fire. Now, if we apply this revelation, this story to Revelation 13, then we can conclude that when the earth beast is trying to bring fire from heaven, it is actually bringing false manifestation of the Holy Spirit. That's what the See, uh, see, uh, earth beast is doing. It's bringing a false manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible is very clear that when Holy Spirit comes upon us, revival always happens because the Holy Spirit drives revival. So Revelation 13 shows us that in the last days there will be a false manifestation of the Holy Spirit which will bring false revival. And this is very, very important. Now, even the text shows us some hints about the Holy Spirit being present here. Remember about the false trinity that I showed to you in the beginning? Dragon, the sea beast, and the earth beast? There are a few hints here, references, Revelation 13, that shows us that the sea beast actually is an imitation of the Holy Spirit. So, let's go Revelation 13, verse 12. There's two that I'm going to give you. Revelation 13, verse 12. It tells us about this, it describes this beast as exercising what? The authority of, who, of the what? The first beast before him. So this satanic ally, the, the earth beast, exercises authority in front of the first beast, which was the sea beast. Remember that? This is an imitation of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit exercises the authority of Jesus Christ. So the second beast, I mean the first beast, which is the sea beast, would be an imitation of Jesus Christ. And I have, I don't have time right now, but I have a chart that you take from Revelation 13 and shows how the sea beast is an imitation of Jesus and how the earth beast is an imitation of the Holy Spirit. It's beautiful how it's related there and they combine together to be the false trinity. But there is another one. If you go to verse 12, it says that this earth beast causes the earth and those who dwell on earth to do what? To worship the first beast. 
this is a definite counterfeit of the Holy Spirit. If you remember in John 15 and, and John 16, when Jesus was going to heaven, he said, I'll send you what? Another helper, right? I'll send you the Holy Spirit. And what was the main mission of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> if you go to John 15, verse 26, Jesus says that when the Spirit comes, he will testify of me. He will give worship and testimony to me. And then in chapter 16, verse 14 of John, Jesus says that the Spirit will glorify me. Do you see that? This earth beast is making everyone to worship and glorify the sea beast, exactly what the Holy Spirit is doing and, and encouraging everyone to glorify and worship Jesus Christ. It's a clear allusion and imitation of the Holy Spirit here in Revelation 13 to show us that this sign of fire that comes down from heaven is related to the false manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the last days. And with this false manifestation of the Holy Spirit comes false revival. Now, we don't need to wait for the last days to see that. <laughs> There are many false manifestations of the Holy Spirit today. Many, many false manifestations of the Holy Spirit. You can just turn on the, the TV and see all of those things uh, on TV. Many people are deceived today in regards to the work of the Holy Spirit. But the Bible tells us that in the last days, this will become... A glo on global scale will be a global deception in regards to the work of the Holy Spirit. And it will be a global deception that will bring a false revival to the people. In a sense, I call it a counterfeit day of Pentecost. <laughs> a counterfeit day of Pentecost. We must be very careful because Satan, his deceptions are very hard to spot them, all right? It's very hard. That's why the Bible tells us that we need this gift of the Spirit that is called spiritual discernment. To discern the spirits. And there will be a lot of spirits coming in the last day claiming many things, but we must have the discernment in our life because in the last days will be a worldwide, global scale deception in regards to the work of the Holy Spirit. We must start preparing ourselves today. Amen? Amen. We must start preparing ourselves today. Let's move on to the third and fourth story. There is one interesting story in Luke chapter 9. <laughs> Luke chapter 9. It's not actually bringing, uh, it's talking about bringing fire from heaven, but it's interesting. Look chapter 9, verses 54 and 55. Um, here we see that uh, a Samaritan village rejects Jesus, all right? They don't want to accept Jesus. And there's two disciples that come up with an interesting plan. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, they come with an interesting plan to really... Punish this people, all right? And you read in verse 54 and 55, they say, Lord, do you want us to command what? Fire to come down from heaven and consume these people, destroy them just as Elijah did. I don't remember Elijah destroying people, but that's a different story, all right? They kind of misinterpreted what Elijah did. And then Jesus said the first part of verse 55, but he, Jesus, turned and did what? Rebuke them. Now, I'm talking to you right now. Um, could we, modern Christians, Adventists, also be, a, also be guilty of misusing fire as this, 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 these disciples did? Can we be guilty of that? <laughs> we are so eager to bring fire down from heaven to destroy people. Yes, it is true that Satan will use the beast to misuse the fire in order to confuse people about the work of the Holy Spirit. And many people will fall for that deception. 
but for those who pride themselves, as we do, to have the right understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit, Satan will set a different trap. We as Adventists might not fall for the false manifestation of the Holy Spirit, but we might fall for this misuse of fire, having a spirit of destruction controlling our lives where we destroy our families, we destroy our brothers and sisters, we destroy everyone around us. The spirit that controls our lives. And let me tell you, either of these will not lead to salvation. (laughs) If you think that you'll be strong and Satan is not going to deceive you with this false fire, false manifestation of this Holy Spirit, but if you have this type of spirit in your life like James and John... God is rebuking you today. Jesus is rebuking you today. And that might be a big trap for many people. We will be watching for all the other signs, but we don't take care of our personal spiritual experience with Jesus on a daily basis. So if you think that we are safe from the beast's deception or false fire, think again. Think again. The fourth story, as we conclude. Revelation 20, verse 7 to 10. I want you to open with me Revelation, please, 20, verse 7 to 10. There will be another time in the earth's history at the end when once again fire will come down from heaven. This event is described in Revelation 20, verse 7 to 10, and you can follow with me. Where the fire, it says, comes down from heaven and does what? Destroys Satan, his angels, and all the wicked people that have ever lived. In the book of Revelation, this is called the lake of fire or second death. There is no resurrection after second death. It's an eternal death, meaning you die once and forever. There is no coming back from them. And it's also described as fire coming down and consuming everyone. My brothers and sisters, this is the fire that I want you to avoid. I want you to receive the fire of the Holy Spirit in your life in the last days. I want you to receive that fire of the Holy Spirit that will make you bold to go and preach the gospel like the disciples did. But I want you to avoid this fire that will come down and devour and destroy everyone in the last days. I was reading an illustration about a small town where the fire department, uh, they didn't have a separate fire department, so the the chief of police had a special phone for the fire department, so he would answer the phone, and then he would send the fire trucks out. It was a small town. So one day a lady calls desperate, and he picks up the phone, and she says, uh, when he picked up the phone, he said, fire department, and a voice on the other side said frantically, send the fire trucks, and then she just, uh, you know, uh, slams the phone down immediately. The police chief stood stunned, not knowing what to do because he doesn't know where to send the fire trucks, all right? He didn't know where the fire is happening. So he waited again, and the phone rings again, and he quickly picks up. He says, fire department. Again, the voice cried, send the trucks, and she slams the phone down again. So the chief thought for a little, for a minute, and said, okay, I'll make, he made a plan. He says, "Uh, I'll do something else when when this lady calls back. So sure enough, the phone rings the third time, and um, he's picking up the phone, but this time, instead of uh, saying fire department, he said, where is the fire? And the lady on the other side of the phone says, in the kitchen, and she slams the phone down. (laughs) I have the same question for you today. Where is the fire in our churches? Where is the fire in your lives? As in the days of Elijah, the fire came and consumed the offering. So today we, as the Bible says, we are the spiritual sacrifice. We are spiritual offering. 
as it consumed the fire in the, days of the, in the days of Elijah, so today the fire of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes on us, it will consume our lives. And that's what we want. Amen? We want the fire of the Holy Spirit to consume us. So we are boldly going and preaching the gospel like the disciples did at the day of Pentecost when the fire of the Holy Spirit came upon them. Where is the fire in our church? Where is the fire in your life? May God bless you as we all together eagerly waiting for that fire to be coming down on us and encourage us, inspire us to be witnesses for Christ. May God bless you. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Our closing hymn is O oh, for that flame of living fire number 264 in